Right. So a collaboratory is it's 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 a center without walls. Um, but is it just a center? I think, the, the, as Richard alluded to earlier on, it's, it has a sense of dynamism about it, it and it has a sense of, of fluidity. So the center can actually shift to where it needs to be at different times and uh, according to who the agents are, who, who are taking responsibility for different attributes of research or different areas around inclusive practice um, uh, as to where they coalesce whether that is in North America or South Africa or in Thailand or in Palestine or wherever, because all of, we have representatives from, from all of those countries here this afternoon. And so the notion is that in terms of a collaboratory to be effective, it necessitates the development of shared values and purpose initially. And a lot of attention and time was, was devoted to the development of those shared values and purposes. And uh, two colleagues in particular, um, Dave Stinton and Patrick Clark, who worked on those and did a tremendous job, I think, in, in identifying our action-oriented values. And you, I would encourage you to get a better understanding of INCLUDE to pop into the website and have a look at those action-oriented values. Uh, because they, they very much identify what's at the heart or what's at the soul of INCLUDE, the International Collaboratory for Leadership in Universally Designed Education. And the necessity then, I think, also to develop um, some uh, collaborative infrastructure. And that infrastructure has come about in relation to our terms of reference, in relation to the distributive leadership approach that we're adopting, uh, drawing on Etienne Wenger's work around communities of practice. Um, and and uh, we coined this phrase yesterday. So learners as leaders and leaders as learners. And I think I'm going to harp on that point there for learners as, as leaders just for a moment because it talks to the strength of student voice and student agency. And my one of my colleagues you'll meet later on, Mustafa Abi from the University of Ibn Zor has shared many uh, student accounts uh, online on the INCLUDE website and, and he has encouraged other students from around the world to, to share their voices and, and, and share their reactions to, uh, to those experiences of either having a disability or coming from an ethnic minority and what those experiences have been in higher education. And I think that's the, the, the notion of INCLUDE is one of leadership, but as I mentioned, ironically, learners are very much part of our leadership process as well. And uh, finally, thinking about technological ready, readiness and the irony of that um, around the development of the actual website as well. Um, and before this is uh, perhaps officially launched, what I'd like to do is to extend my deepest thanks, particularly to two colleagues, and you'll hear from both of them later on, um, Aisha Abdul-Sattar and uh, Dr. Betsy Dalton, who had put in tremendous work in relation to the development of the INCLUDE website, and, and also to all of the content managers who've come forward uh, to generate lots of interesting materials for colleagues to share and to interact and engage so welcome once again. And uh, at this stage, perhaps I'll pass over to Richard to briefly, perhaps, uh, launch the website officially. And then um, I'm going to call on uh, Ashna Kurana um, to come in as the host. And Ashna uh, works for an NGO in India, um, looking at the inclusion, particularly of, er of children with early in the early childhood sector um, with special educational needs. So over to yourself, Richard, to kind of... Oh, just, just to say, I'm, I'm where... Put the ribbon. We, <laughs> this is uh, the, the uh, I guess, uh, makes it a public official launch of the website. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about it. You've had a chance to look at the video on the website, but I'll just come back to the idea of the collaboratory briefly and ask you to look at this logo up at the top left of the screen. Ah. We had a lot of time, uh, spent a lot of time coming up with a logo and had a lot of good advice and we have a logo that we hope you like. We're, we're all pretty happy with it. But just to, to, uh, to 
to talk about the idea of of a uh, of a of a community of learners, uh, a community of practice that is in the center of the collaboratory is hopefully its expertise. It's uh, distributed among the founders and the steering committee and the content leaders. And in the wide periphery of the collaboratory would be uh, folks that are intrigued and interested and curious about universal design and start to, and share some of the values that we make, make explicit about inclusion and about uh, opportunity uh, and progress uh, globally. And you can, you can see folks from the periphery coming in and learning from the areas of expertise. And you can see uh, folks in the center learning a lot as they, uh, from people coming in from the periphery because they're bringing different contexts from yeah. over the world. And then as the community builds and communicates through the uh, seg sections of the website, there'll be a lot of lateral work going uh, back and forth. So you could see this vibrant, uh, community uh, of learners that are, are leading, just as, as Sean said, leading is going in multiple directions and what emerges is uh, a kind of collective shared appreciation for students that have been, students and individuals that have been marginalized all over the world. So that's the dream. And Sean, I'm gonna pass it back to you and I'll stop sharing my screen and we can move on with today's program. That's great. And again, like that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ashna Kurana. So Ashna, if you kind of make yourself available. And in the inter interim, if I could ask other colleagues perhaps to mute your video. So if you could turn off your video, please, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Ashna, great to see you. So um, hopefully you will take over the screen. There we go. We'll yeah. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard and Sean, for welcoming everyone and giving a background to include as well as launching the website. So, good day, everyone. I'm being universal here by saying good day because we have people from all over the world and we all are in different time zones right now. And this sounds so thrilling to me. So now, moving on to the agenda of the webinar, uh, I would like to invite Geraldine O'Neill. Geraldine is an associate professor and educational developer at UCD in Ireland. She is also a principal fellow of UK's Higher Education Community Academy. She has progressed an institutional approach to program-based program focus assessment. In a recent two-year segment to Ireland's National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning, she coordinated the National Assessment Enhancement Team. Geraldine will draw on her experience with universal design for learning to illuminate how uh, online assessment processes can become more effective and inclusive. Uh, I'm going to present her presentation now. Uh, Geraldine, um, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Ashna. And um, yes, just to, to reiterate that, I'm delighted to be invited. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as I say, I'm here from University College Dublin. It's, it's about as we say, half past two here, or 2.30, as some of you might say. Um, and uh, in, we're, I'm in Bray, County Wicklow, actually, just, just outside Dublin. So I want to talk today about our, I suppose, our experience over the last couple of weeks going online. Um, and I want to just share some of the lessons that, that I suppose I've observed. Um, and I suppose looking at it in relation to the implications for um, universal design for learning. I'm using the term here alternative assessment, interestingly, because at the time we were thrown into the situation where staff had to come up with an alternative assessment because they now could no longer do the usual assessments. So that's, I suppose, why we're using the term alternative assessments. I'm also going to draw a little bit on my work, um, as Ashna said, from the National Forum and, and, and allude a little bit to what is happening in Ireland in this space as well. Um, so Ashna, could you move on to the next slide for me, please? Um, so I'm going to draw on, this is new, not new to most of you, uh, the Universal Design for Learning, um, I suppose, um, areas. There's the um, multiple means of engagement, which is a bit more the why of learning, uh, multiple means of representation, the what of learning, action and expression, the how of learning. And uh, those of you that are familiar with it know that there, there's sort of the nine guidelines that go with that. So I'll be alluding back to these areas 
um, as, I, as I go through my talk. Um, so ne next slide, Ashna, please. At the point where um, I suppose COVID-19 came in, we were all as, as thrown up in the air about what to do um, and how do we all go online. Un university College Dublin is not particularly an online university. It's a very big campus-based university. So this was new to an awful lot of people in University College Dublin. It would be also very interesting um, in the chat um, if people could actually put in any of the things that they did or echo with them. It would be great to see what you did in your own institutions. But at that point in time, we had to very quickly put together some advice to staff. So our unit, University College Dublin, um, put together a resource on the good practices in, in <coughs> alternatives to online, to alternatives to assessments that they were using. And my colleagues in the National Forum and the Irish um, AHEAD Association, which is the Association for Higher Education Access and Disability, put together some resources and these, um, 10 kind of broad areas came out as areas that we should really try and think about in designing for assessments that are now primarily online due to COVID-19 and that are accessible and inclusive. So just to go through some, some of them quite quickly, first of all, the assessment should, should be reasonably familiar. Um, this, people would not have had the time to actually upskill in a lot of it, so they had to be familiar. It's important that there's a clear contact for students to communicate, so um, supports are really important. Um, liaising with the Disability and Access Office was a key one that came up through um, sort of certainly the Access Office, to keep in contact um, with the Access Office. Offering students a choice, where possible we were advising, do give students a choice if you can, give them a choice of either or, this way they can play to their strengths. Um, Really important was the clarity of what's expected of the students. We were really pushing this idea. It really, really needs to be very clear um, what students, uh, what, what's expected of them, what they're meant to be doing. Trialing unfamiliar te technologies. This is, was really important as well. If people were going to try new stuff, um, certainly in our, in our kind of time frame, we had a couple of weeks for, before the assessment period. And so people were really advised, you know, don't just land technologies on students, try them out, as we've known ourselves, we're trying, trying the Zoom today. Um, and this really fits with the, with the multiple means of action and expression, you know, the graduated levels of support. It really is important to give support um, when something is new in the online environment. Um, accessible formats and basic digital accessibility principles, obviously, is very, very important. Um, but one thing we were advising, we knew this from the very start, that timed online testing a little bit like the exams, exam hall scenario was always going to be problematic for some students or for many students. So we, from the very beginning, we advised where possible, please try and avoid very tight timed assessments because this equally online was going to cause some trouble. Um, we advise about opportunities to support each other, uh, for students to be able to support each other and really thinking about equi equitable in terms of the assessment load, effort and standards. Um, so this was this was really kind of quite key um, in relation to advice. So it really needs to be equitable, not additional workload. So the next slide, please, Ashna. One thing that I know from my work in the National Forum, and I know this print is small, it's not very uh, universal design principles, but all I really want you to concentrate on this slide is the light blue colour here. And the light blue colour here is the examination um, format used in Ireland before COVID-19. And you can see from this that in many of the different disciplines, which goes along the bottom there, that there are the light blue is the most common exam. And certainly in some disciplines, the examination is, is, is a huge uh, proportion of their, of their examinations. So this is the context um, post-COVID. And suddenly now we're in a situation where they're not using this as, as, an, exam, as an exam form. Um, one of the advantages of this is that we know this is a problematic, so maybe there's some light in the end of the tunnel here in relation to a change, but this was the context pre-COVID-19, a lot of exams happening in Ireland. So if you could move on to the next slide, Ashna. So equally in UCD, um, we have very high percentage of exams. This is a, a picture of the exam hall in UCD, and we have very, very large scale exams. Um, and this in itself is not very inclusive. 
Um, so in some ways, we're really looking forward to what will happen next. Will these less chairs happen in, in, in the years to come? Will we be moving away from this context? So we, we know that, that um, UCD and Ireland has this kind of a context. So next slide, please. So what did we do? There were three broad areas of um, options for staff. Um, the first one was at the exam using the original paper because people had set their papers at this stage when that happened. So many kind of were not, unable to make huge changes to that. So the, the simplest option for some people uh, was the same exam and in a time, timed or in a limited time, say two to four hours. That was probably done by quite a few people, um, maybe about you know 30% of people. The next option was to use the original exam paper, but maybe make it now open book available to other students that they could take it away. And it could be from half days up to you know, two weeks. Um, and in this situation, the material um, and access to resources was allowed. Whereas in option one there, it was generally not allowed. And these can cause hassles. We can come back to the challenges with those. And the, the last option was that the um, assignments was, um, that people could do an assignment. So this was not like the original exam paper. It could be quite different, had as much time as people needed. Um, and certainly they could access resources and acknowledge resources. Um, so, um, just looking at some of, the, some of the chat stuff there as well. Professional bodies stipulating exams. Yes, this is going to be an interesting one going forward. Um, Sarah mentioning that, same in vocational areas. Yeah, yeah, nice to see those sort of stuff in the chat. So next slide, Ashna, please. So what do we learn from this? Well, looking at sort of the, um, the first two here in particular, the ones that looked like exams, either kind of very tightly timed and not allowed materials, or that they had actually um, the same exam, but you know, stretched. Some people call it open book, some people call it takeaway. Well, on a positive note for universal design, um, now people are able to use their computers. Um, and, and, and in a lot of the exam context in Ireland, unless you, if you need a computer, you have to have special accommodations. So in some ways, this was a very positive thing. It allowed people to use the, the, the software and the technologies that go with computer. Um, it was in their own home, not in the exam hall, which for a lot of students, the, the anxiety of not being in exam hall. And we, got, we have got a lot of feedback about that, that it was less stressful not being in an exam hall. It accommodated a lot of students, particularly in relation to sort of multiple means of representation. And in the version two there, they were allowed, they were, had time to access resources. And this allowed them to sort of, again, um, collaborate with others. It allowed them, again, from the stress levels and accessing resources, it was certainly positive. However, um, certainly in option one, the times constraints things did not suit a lot of students. Um, and even some of the institutions around Ireland didn't even allow that option. Um, so that was a big you know, challenge for some students, you know, students with dyslexia and other, other students that the time constraint was still a challenge. And the big thing that was coming through as well was access to Wi-Fi um, and the, the kind of the, the lack of um, equity in relation to students' Wi-Fi. The other one, uh, talking to my colleague Lisa Patton this morning, thank, I know Lisa's sitting in here, uh, mentioned that a lot of the students struggled with the language around these, um, these types. You know, what was the difference between a take-home and a take-away and central, and the language around it confused and put a lot of students under stress. So there's something about the language here that's very important to, to get right. So ne next slide, please, Ashna. Just looking at the, the issue of Wi-Fi, there was a recent national survey done in Ireland, and it's the first time it was done, um, called the Index Survey, the Irish National Digital Experience Survey, and it was done before COVID-19. And 25,000 students um, answered this survey across 32 institutions. And one of the things that we know from this, um, in the next slide, please, is that it's going back, back to the issue of Wi-Fi. We know from this survey that in Ireland, 70% of the students compared to 82% in the UK uh, did, not, um, did not have reliable, or sorry, did have reliable Wi-Fi. So um, there's a higher proportion of students did not have reliable um, Wi-Fi say, than the UK. And this, was, uh, this came out in relation equally to Wi-Fi across people's homes and the broadband. And this is, this is something we really need to think of in relation to equity and inclusion. 
um, it's all right going online, but if students cannot access uh, materials and cannot access assessments, then, then we are, you know, we are, we're cutting out a whole group of students. And uh, interesting, Ashna from India, I, I see it coming up in the Twitter a lot from India about the inequality in relation to Wi-Fi and online assessments. Um, so, so next slide, please. In relation to the assignments, there was quite a range of different assignments um, that people tried out. Um, lots of different ones, for example, in the oral um, presentations that were meant to be face-to-face, -face, people did Google Hangouts, um, people did lots of different types of assessments, in-class in presentations, they did record over. So there was a lot of variety, I won't go through them all, um, but you can see that even looking at this, there was, there was a really nice mix of different assessments coming through in relation to assignments. And the next slide, please, Ashna. Um, we do know um, from the, the study that myself and Lisa are, are doing in this space, that a lot of people diversified. Of the 70 people in a study that we are, are doing at the moment, 40% um, of that 70 said that they had diversified because of COVID-19. So there was a lot of change and a lot of diversification. So this, this is a good thing. Um, so the, so the more diversification generally, the better for diverse students' needs. Um, and next slide, please, Ashna. So in relation to the assignments, what, what we found really was this had opened the eyes for a lot of people to new approaches. There's never been so much change in one occasion. Um, they certainly did wider alternatives that lots of people were doing audio and visual that had never done it before and were very not comfortable in this space and, and in some ways were made to do it. So there was really a nice wide variation of alternatives. Um, one of the things that was coming through, they were using more authentic and engaging approaches, um, which again, if you look at the universal design, multiple means of engagement, it really is hitting that idea of multiple means of engagement and, and authenticity. Um, Sometimes people did this as a result of a consequence of fear of plagiarism, which maybe um, is a huge issue here is about the worry about plagiarism. Um, but it, in general, that was, it was really nice to see authentic. The downside of this, however, um, of diversity, as, as, as many know, is that too much diversity and too much uncontrolled or not managed diversity increases students' cognitive load and stress. Um, and, and we really know from the literature and we know um, from, from this that too much diversity is not necessarily a good thing either. So we really need to keep a track on this. Um, next slide, please. So um, what we've talked about here is um, assessment of learning. I'm talking here particularly about summative of assessment. This slide here is actually the Irish definition of assessment from summative to formative. Um, and one of the things I suppose that we would be really looking, I suppose, going forward is um, what are we doing in the space of feedback, which is sort of the, the blue and the purple in this diagram, and particularly in the blue here, and this is the idea of students being able to self-monitor, to know how well they're doing, there's really great opportunities to enhance this in, in the new online spaces. So the final slide, please. So what I would say to, to, to kind of wrap up is that I believe uh, that this has been in some ways from a teaching and learning um, point of view, uh, some a lot of positivity. Uh, we're further along the road, I think, in supporting each other and the students in their unique ways of learning. Um, but we do still have a, a way to go in relation to making sure that we really hit those universal design for learning um, attributes. Um, but in general, I think we, we'll have learned and, and, and I suppose got some very positive opportunities from, from this COVID-19 experience. So thank you for listening. I'll leave it at that and I'm happy for any questions or whatever way uh, Sean wants to handle it there, yeah. Assessment of learning is one of my big interests. I see that, yeah, well, we've done a lot of work on that and pushing the idea of students being able to self-monitor. Veer and I'm just looking at some of the chat questions. In the US, some public libraries are able to share. Nice to see that, Elizabeth. Yeah, that, that's a great, um, that is a great, actually, uh, strategy that, that there's some spaces that students can go to for the, for the Wi-Fi. Thanks, Marion. Thank you for that. Good to see you there. Um, I'll hand it back in case, I know you're under probably time pressure. I'm happy to talk further, but if you're under time pressure, I'm happy to hand back to you, Ashna. Uh, 
Geraldine, that was an amazing presentation that talked about how online assessments can become accessible and inclusive and how they offer wider alternatives for audio and visuals as well. So you have very well highlighted the lessons learned and how you have very well highlighted the lessons learned and how to address them using available alternative modes like Google Meet, Hangout, video assignments. Uh, yeah. amongst many more. Thank you so much, Geraldine, for your presentation. Yeah, I'm happy to chat, you know, people want to. I'll keep a little eye on the chat. And, um, but yeah, thank you for that. I'll hand you back to you, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Can I, again, can I just ask colleagues to mute their videos if they're not presenting? Thank you. And over to you, uh, Ashna. Yeah. So further, I would like to introduce you all to David Gordon. David Gordon is the Director for Publishing and Communications at CAST, Center for Applied Special Technology, a globally renowned nonprofit or education, research and development organization working to expand learning opportunities for all individuals. David will provide insights into the pivotal role that UBL has played in the transition to online learning in the higher education sector in the USA. Over to you, David. Okay, well, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be uh, here today and uh, celebrate the launch of Include and talk about, uh, talk about these very important issues. I'm going to just share my screen here in my slides. And uh, let's see, I'm going to get into the proper mode. Uh, from the beginning. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see that? So um, the um, uh, I'll try to be quick and, and get through some of the uh, responses to COVID and get down to the nitty gritty of some of the issues that really impact not only folks here in the United States, but all over the world. Um, as many of you know, the United States has a sort of interesting model uh, in education. There's, there is uh, a lot of local control. This goes back, uh, uh, you know, way back to the foundation of public in the U.S., where um, particular towns, villages, cities, uh, even districts within cities have significant control over how education uh, is administered, uh, the choices that are made, and that local control has really been emphasized during the COVID, um, during the COVID uh, episode. There have been wide differences in scheduling, in the kinds of curriculum that's been implemented, in the sorts of supports uh, that have been uh, provided to students. Well, there have been tremendous differences across uh, from from town to town, uh, even from uh, district to district in grading. Uh, some towns have done away with grading altogether in this last quarter. Some have uh, uh, continued to implement grading, but uh, uh, they've had difficulty uh, in doing that with um, uh, some changes in how uh, how uh, the curriculum plays out. Um, standardized tests in many places have been done away with at the K-12 level, certainly. They've just been um, abandoned for this year. Uh, that's significant because a lot of uh, policy is uh, formulated around the results of standardized tests, for better or worse. And so uh, that has basically been postponed for a year. And in many districts, um, there's just been an agreement to simply promote students uh, to the next grade, to not hold anyone back, uh, regardless of whether they've really been able to um, learn anything in the last uh, quarter of the school year here. Uh, so there are really varying definitions from place to place of what remote learning means. In some cases, uh, some districts have been able to uh, provide some online um, uh, live uh, teaching where, where students are able to use a Zoom 
and other uh, tools and actually interact with teachers in a live setting. In many cases that that has not been implemented. There have been, again, videos and uh, um, uh, handouts and things like that. And then the opportunity to use email or chat rooms to communicate with teachers. But again, that how we define remote learning or distance learning has really changed from uh, district to district on a very micro, very local level. Uh, another great uncertainty, of course, are budget staffing and timeline, especially going forward into the next uh, fiscal year. Um, as you know, we've, we've uh, had anywhere from 15 to 20 percent unemployment now in the United States. There's been a tremendous hit on municipalities in terms of um, in terms of budgets, in terms of tax revenue, et cetera. And all of this is going to somehow impact schools. We don't have a full picture of that yet. And we don't know actually going into the fall what COVID-19 uh, will allow. Uh, some, some states, actually, Florida being the latest yesterday, came out and said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to have uh, in-person school, everyone's going to school, and we're going to figure out how to make it work. Uh, I think Betsy Dalton uh, in Rhode Island, uh, uh, I think that uh, the same thing has been uh, said there, and there are other states um, with such examples. In my own town's um, case, they've said, well, we're going to have some kind of hybrid. You know, we'll only allow 10 students in the class at a time where there usually are 20 to 25 students in a class. And so we're gonna have to develop complex schedules where students come in and out of the school, get some time at home, get some face-to-face -face time. So there's just, uh, in, in essence, it's a lot of chaos right now. The federal response has been uh, pretty hands-off. I mean, the Congress came through with almost $31 billion in money that's split pretty evenly between uh, institutions of higher education uh, and K-12 schools. And uh, the money has been uh, delivered uh, primarily to state departments of education to let them figure out what to do. Uh, for the K-12 schools or directly to uh, post-secondary uh, um, institutions. Uh, there was a great debate in April uh, about whether in K-12 schools um, special education requirements would be waived. Uh, we've had the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in the United States for uh, well over uh, 20 years, and uh, there was some concern that students with disabilities would be uh, basically cut out, uh, and that the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Education would allow states and districts to waive um, uh, special ed requirements. In fact, that did not happen. There was quite a lot written about it, a cast, and many of our fellow uh, disability advocacy organizations uh, wrote letters to Congress people, to the secretary herself, um, and uh, she said that uh, they would not waive those requirements. Uh, another great debate was whether money, uh, federal money, could be used uh, only for public schools or would some of that uh, aid go to private and in particular religious schools. Um, the, the uh, federal response was, yes, that money can be used uh, for private and religious schools. And in fact, uh, there were instructions given down to the states to be sure to, uh, uh, to dole out some of that money to these private institutions. Uh, again, um, a hot topic here and one that uh, uh, created quite a bit of controversy. Um, Institutions of higher education going forward. Um, <laughs> the Chronicle of Higher Education is is kind of updating this uh, these numbers daily as they uh, survey uh, post secondary institutions, and this is the latest um, set of figures as of uh, June 11th. Uh, 
67% uh, of higher education institutions are planning to resume in-person uh, education in the fall. 67% uh, of those uh, surveyed, which is, uh, as you can see, 950 organizations now. Uh, another 9% are uh, considering a hybrid model with some in-person, some online. Uh, there are certain courses that are almost impossible to do online, especially hands-on uh, laboratory type courses. And so uh, some of these institutions are trying to figure out ways of opening up on a limited basis with um, secure and safe ways of moving forward. If there are courses that can be conducted largely online, then uh, they're looking uh, to do that. 9% uh, are, uh, another 9% are sort of up in the air right now. They're still trying to figure it out. Uh, there are 8% of organizations that have said, you know what, we're just going to commit to going, um, going online. Um, and uh, another 7% are kind of waiting to decide whether to open at all. There are some institutions that have said, you know, we're not even going to try to open until January of 2021. Uh, it's too complex. We cannot commit resources going forward to a particular model that we might have to scrap. And so let's just postpone until uh, January of 2021. So that's sort of the, uh, where we are. Here are some interesting questions that are, again, on a daily basis being asked in the education communities uh, here in the US. Is this the end of paper? I mean, now that so many schools and uh, institutions of higher ed have uh, put uh, resources online, gone to digital books, uh, increased the use of video, increased the use of chat rooms and other kinds of digital formats. The question is, will they stay with that even when students come back? Uh, flexible scheduling. Uh, a lot of um, uh, districts, a lot of students, a lot of parents have actually uh, found benefits in uh, the kind of flexible schedule that uh, at-home learning has allowed. And this is raising questions about, uh, for example, could we use some of these strategies and formats that have been developed during this time to address uh, school schedules? There have been great debates uh, in the U.S. and probably in other countries about, for example, a high school schedules where research shows that uh, teenagers uh, benefit biologically, mentally, uh, and otherwise uh, from uh, having later start, day, uh, start times. Uh, they do better if they get more sleep. They do better if they sleep later. And so rather than starting at 7.30 in the morning, should they start at 9.30? All of those kinds of conversations are being raised again. Um, uh, in this time. Uh, flipped and blended, uh, uh, are they here to stay? Very good question. Um, caregiver and parent responsibilities in the K-12 space. I think all uh, parents that I know have certainly been uh, kind of uh, uh, shocked into uh, a remembrance and realization of just how hard teachers work. Uh, but also how important it is for them to be involved and very knowledgeable about what their kids are learning. Uh, and, uh, and it's been a kind of wake up call, I think, for a lot of citizens that they uh, need to be more uh, engaged, more involved, more knowledgeable about what is happening in terms of the curriculum and what their kids are learning. And of course, there have been vast inequities exposed by COVID-19. Um, this recent McKinsey study out this week showed that uh, the so-called summer slide, what kids tend to lose over the summer months when they're off school, uh, will be, of course, much greater this year because, in fact, many kids uh, are not have not been learning at all since mid-March. Um, and in some districts, uh, uh, education was simply abandoned 
in mid-March. And so that summer slide really will be a spring and summer slide. And it's going to create enormous challenges when education does resume to play catch up, particularly since those kids will be promoted to the next grade without having uh, completed uh, standards-based uh, standards curriculum uh, this year. There's talk of creating pow so-called power standards uh, for the coming year, which basically uh, try to pack a year and a half of education into the next coming year. You can imagine that's going to create all kinds of challenges, both for the students who traditionally uh, fall on the wrong side of the achievement gap, they have that much farther to come, but also for educators who uh, have enough to do going forward. Uh, a lot of this has really pointed up these key concepts of universal design for learning and universal design and really uh, brought them home to uh, educators that we've been in contact with at least. One core concept is that disability is all about context, right? Learning barriers stem from the environment, not from the person. And, uh, and the burden of adaptation, the burden is on the curriculum and on the environment, not on the in individual. It's not the responsibility of the individual to adapt uh, to an inaccessible environment. It's our responsibility to provide an accessible and a universally designed environment so that everyone has an equal opportunity to learn. Uh, this has, um, the, the whole COVID scenario and learning at home, distance learning, changing up um, uh, the methods and materials we need to learn has really uh, exposed uh, the importance of this concept because many of us feel very disabled, and I put that in air quotes, uh, as we try to operate and learn now in this digital environment, as we try to teach in this digital environment. Teachers have learned uh, that they needed to uh, quickly get up to speed on a lot of skills. Um, the AIM Center at CAS, the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials, this is a center CAST has been leading in some form or another since 1999. And Richard Jackson, uh, co-founder of this Include uh, Collaboratory, was uh, there in 1999 at the outset. Uh, Richard has been uh, on CAST staff for a day a week, uh, in addition to his Boston College work, and a very important figure in uh, the development of this, but our National Center on Accessible Educational Materials, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Education, has never been busier. We've been conducting uh, uh, almost daily uh, webinars, uh, workshops, uh, doing technical assistance uh, for states and for districts uh, and for teachers. We've created uh, a wealth of resources uh, for access. Um, and what we've discovered is that really their uh, moving learning online has revealed a real lack of understanding of basic accessibility concepts uh, among even teachers who thought they knew it all. Uh, the, 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 for, for one, there's been a great misconception that digital is accessible. It's not. Uh, digital materials sometimes have greater barriers uh, than print materials if they're locked in. Uh, David Rose has been saying that for years. Uh, if there's a if there's a, a digital lock on the material and you can't break it and, and and transform it into an accessible material, that's even worse than a print material. But what we found is. Um, a lot of educators uh, don't really understand the basic concepts of creating accessible video, accessible PDFs, uh, accessible websites, uh, color contrast, alt tags, uh, options for uh, font size, uh, using accessible fonts, uh, all kinds of basics. And so in many ways, CAST has really gone back to basics in providing technical assistance 
uh, across the country uh, in a basic understanding and trying to educate people about basic accessibility concepts. Without that groundwork, without that foundation, it's very hard to proceed to the more detailed and complex uh, ideas in the UDL guidelines. Um, another uh, core concept of UDL that has been reinforced during this time and a lot of our friends and colleagues who thought they knew UDL uh, have learned again that uh, uh, offering many ways to reach the same destination is so important. We've often used this GPS analogy where you get in your car and you set a goal. And along the way, uh, the GPS, if it's good, will um, recalculate um, you, the means by which you get to that goal. Uh, it will assess the landscape. It will see potential barriers and roadblocks. That might be traffic, that might be construction, that might be uh, a police officer pulling someone over ahead uh, for speeding. It might be a lot of things. Um, it also, uh, the GPS might also give you choices in how you want to reach your destination. If you've got a little more time to get there, you might choose not to ride on highways, but to take nice country roads that have a little more scenery that are a little easier uh, and less stressful to drive, go at a slower speed, et cetera. So, Sorry, just you, yes. you mentioned there about the availability of time and uh, that's a resource, unfortunately, that, that we're, that's pretty finite at the minute. Okay. So, sorry, just to kind of, um, instead of taking the country lanes, which we would all prefer in terms yes. of, with, the, with the scenic view, if you wouldn't mind, bring us right there. And I love this next slide. So I'm going to let you back. Yeah. So, and I'll just wrap up my apologies. And, um, uh, um, uh, a new wrinkle, of course, going into the fall is, is the tremendous upheaval created by the George Floyd uh, protests, uh, the very important and real questions that this has raised, which also will have a tremendous impact on the way curriculum is written and implemented across IHEs, post-secondary institutions, and across K-12 education in the U.S. And so I think that may be true globally, but certainly in the U.S., this is going to be a very important um, question going forward. So everyone feel free to email me, check out the resources we shared here, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David, for making us aware of the responses in higher education sector in the U.S and accessible educational materials as well. I believe most of the nations are thinking about the same issue during these unprecedented times and UDL definitely has a potential to provide effective solutions to these disruptions all over the world. Uh, now, um, moving forward to our next session, uh, which will be presented in an interesting way by Aisha Abdul Sattar. Aisha is a course leader at UNISA, which is the largest online university in South Africa and serves a global body of learners, Aisha will address the issues of digital inequalities and how universal design for learning may be able to bridge some of the, uh, some of the digital learning gaps, especially among marginalized communities. For ease in the smooth flow of today's webinar, Aisha has recorded the session because sometimes where she lives in South Africa, there's unstable internet connection. Like Geraldine mentioned, the Wi-Fi is not reliable. And this issue of internet is quite common in various countries in the global south, uh, where the access to internet is there, but the quality of internet is not up to the mark. So uh, therefore, we have adopted innovative ways like this to uh, ensure continued learning and sharing of knowledge. So here I'm sharing my screen to present what Aisha has to say about the gaps in digital learning and how to bridge them. Uh, give me a second. Uh, yeah, here it is. Does e-learning benefit all learners? This is the question I ask you today. 
My name is Aisha Abdul Sitar from the University of South Africa. In view of the pandemic that we're all going through and the move to e-learning that we have transitioned to, I ask you this question in order to consider the aspect of digital exclusion in e-learning contexts. What I will also discuss is how UDL can be used to overcome the challenges of digital exclusion. Well, in the e-learning context, the things that I would like to discuss are digital inclusion, digital exclusion, digital access, digital literacy, and UDL to the rescue. These are all interrelated concepts that I will discuss one at a time. Firstly, digital inclusion. What does this mean? It means having access to and also having the knowledge of important technologies and applications for effective e-learning. Well then, what does digital exclusion refer to? Digital exclusion means the lack of access to and or knowledge of pertinent technologies and applications to switch to online learning. This is what we refer to as the digital divide, which is extremely real. So what do we understand by the digital divide? There are two aspects that we need to understand to be able to understand what we mean by the digital divide, and that is access and accessibility. What is the difference? Access refers to the ability to fully participate in the digital society. It includes access to tools and technologies such as the internet and computers that allow for full participation in e-learning. There are two aspects to digital access. Infrastructure, which refers to the development of areas and localities to facilitate access to the internet pertinent for e-learning, and access to digital devices. This means the ownership of or the loan of these devices through community centers or rentals. And when we talk of digital devices, we talk of laptops, tablets, mobile phones, etc., that are vital for e-learning. Well then, what does accessibility mean then? Accessibility refers to the ability of a website, mobile application, or electronic document to be easily navigated and understood by a wide range of users, including those users who have visual, auditory, motor, or cognitive disabilities. Accessibility, in other words, is useful to persons with disabilities. Example, in the form of assistive technologies, devices and applications, such as screen readers for visually impaired individuals, for example, and also website and learning management system compliance to accessibility guidelines, such as the web content accessibility guidelines. Are any of our LMSs, LMSs actually compatible with these guidelines? I think many learning management systems are not compatible with these guidelines and many websites are also not compatible with these guidelines. So we need to familiarize ourselves with these guidelines before we switch to e-learning or try and integrate these changes while we're moving towards e-learning. This is a question I want you all to ponder on. Is the digital divide only applicable to the global south? Or are there issues of the digital divide in the global north? This is something that we all need to think about. Well, now that we've discussed digital inclusion and digital exclusion, I go into digital access. Although we've touched on it earlier, I want to go into the statistics and what do the numbers say about digital access? Well, how do people around the world access digital technologies and the internet? What do the statistics say? And how does this change the way in which we switch to e-learning? The Global Digital Population Index of 2020 
actually indicates that 60% of the global population has some form of digital access. This figure worries me a bit. Although we say 60% of the global population has some form of digital access, it means that 40% of the global population does not have access to digital, uh, to digital uh, technologies. So what does this mean? That of those 40% that do not have access, some of them are in your classroom. And what do we do with those learners who do not have digital access? This is the, the graph that was displayed earlier. It's just a bit clearer. What's really important here is that we see that active mobile internet users worldwide is 4.2 billion people. And this is the latest statistics in April 2020. So this tells us a lot of important information. It indicates that many users are using mobile technologies to actually access the internet, which gives us some indication of how to implement our e-learning strategies. Now, we need to know the concentration of mobile usage around the world. Well, the statistics show that Latin America, Africa, and the MENA region, that's the Middle East and North African regions, actually show the highest concentration of mobile usage in the world. This is a summary of some of the basic statistics that were important to me on internet usage worldwide. In Europe and North America, people spend more time accessing the internet via computers and tablets than they do via mobile phones. In all other regions, more online time is spent on mobiles. In Latin America, the average time spent on mobile phones is four and a half hours um, a day. So th this is really important statistics. Internet access in the EU, over the past 10 years, the share of households with access to the internet in the European Union has increased steadily to reach 90% in 2019. Well, the figures were different just back in 2007, where 55% of EU households had internet access. So this shows the changing trends in internet usage in Europe. Well, Africa shows a different statistic altogether. If you look at this graph, internet users in Africa in 2019, there's a staggering difference between different countries. Like Nigeria, for instance, has a high penetration of internet users, but Libya is right at the bottom with low concentration of internet users. So we're seeing different statistics in different parts of Africa. Now I'm going into South Africa because this is the context of UNISA. So we need to understand our population first. So the digital population in South Africa in 2020, active internet users is 36.5 million users. This is around about 58% of our population. And of that, we see active mobile internet users. It's almost all of the people that have active, active internet uh, usage they are accessing the internet via mobile technology. So that's 34.93 million people. So this gives us a lot of information about how to uh, draft our e-learning strategies. All right, so what we're seeing is that mobile technologies are penetrating the market. The statistics show that clearly. Mobile internet usage is also increasing. Mobile technologies provide a solution to the challenges of poor infrastructure in South Africa and possibly in the region as well. Costs of access to mobile technologies and mobile internet connections are much more affordable. So we've already gone through all the statistics worldwide. Now we're going to the next step, which is digital literacy. So what do we understand by digital literacy? This means the ability to access, manage, understand, integrate, communicate, evaluate, and create information safely and appropriately through digital devices and network technologies for a purpose. Example, e-learning or e-commerce. Our purpose is e-learning at the moment. 
Digital literacy also encompasses competences that are variously referred to as computer literacy, ICT literacy, information literacy, and media literacy. Now let's see some information about the worldwide statistics on digital literacy. And then we talk about the digital literacy global framework. Worldwide, I'll give you a small review of digital uh, literacy globally. There's a lack of comprehensive statistics on digital literacy in each country. But some of the statistics that we do have, they actually reveal that the lack of digital skills and literacy is a barrier to internet access in North Africa. For example, there was a survey done in Egypt in 2015, which showed that 38% of people in Egypt did not use the internet due to the lack of digital skills and literacy. So this leads to not accessing the internet because of fear of it due to lack of knowledge. In another statistic, we're seeing a report by the Pew Research Center, which found that 40% of American adults lack basic technological skills and knowledge. In another part of the world, in Russia, the statistics published in January 2020 revealed that individuals displayed low levels of competence in digital content creation. So we're seeing all different aspects of digital literacy or digital illiteracy in different parts of the world. But although these are scant results, but we're seeing some important trends here. Now, there's a digital literacy global framework which was established or is established by the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. And they are trying to identify assessment tools to monitor digital literacy skills. And these are some of the important points that we should consider when we implement e-learning. The framework features seven competence areas. The first is fundamentals of hardware and software, information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content creation, safety on, on the internet, problem solving, and career-related competences. These are all related to digital literacy. So let's see the DLG framework. These are some important documents that you can read on your own. There's a blog called Digital Literacy Skills from a Framework to a Measure, and that's uh, actually analyzing the entire framework from UNESCO. And the framework itself, a global framework of reference on digital literacy skills for indicator 4.4.2. This is uh, a PDF document that you can peruse to understand more about digital literacy. Now the big question, do your students have these digital literacy competencies? Or do they not? How does this change your e-learning strategy? Finally, we come to UDL to the rescue. All right. We understand now that digital exclusion is a problem, but how do we solve this? We can use the basic principles of UDL to actually come to the rescue. So the universal design of learning anticipates barriers to learning. In the same way, it will anticipate digital exclusion due to digital literacy and digital access issues. And we should envision this in such a way that we plan for the use of different modes of instruction and assessment. So what does UNISA do differently? So the University of South Africa is an open distance and e-learning institution. So although we've been open distance and e-learning, we use a blended mode of tuition and assessment. This means that we use a lot of the postal service, we use a lot of uh, venue-based examinations, but this all had to change with the pandemic. So, and besides that, we have students that have various issues with digital exclusion in terms of access and literacy. And that's when UNISA created all these uh, digital centers and access centers for students, but these are not accessible now due to the pandemic. So what did we do? So the strategy, 
Because of the pandemic, venue-based examinations have been cancelled. So we have hundreds of thousands of students writing examinations during the June examination period. This is actually mid-semester for us, mid-year for us, this mid-year semester. So we, you, we went completely online with examinations. Some modules do write portfolio exams, so that continues, but now most of the other modules that write venue-based exams all around the world. We've used timed examinations online with different durations for various modules. We have an online academic integrity declaration that students have to fill in before submitting the examination. Various training programs have been provided for students to train them in the use of these new formats and tools. Lecturers have also been trained. Students unable to access the examination in this semester due to whatever access issues or whatever other issues, they will get automatic deferment to the next semester's examination in October, November. What opportunity did we see? We've seen that students have wide scale access to mobile devices. So the university has signed contracts with various mobile network and service providers to provide free data for students from May to July 2020. The university is using varied online examination formats and tools that can be used on different devices. So these were all the opportunities we've seen and that we've taken advantage of for this semester's exams. And the investment, what investment did UNISA make? UNISA, UNISA, uh, the university is investing millions of rands to extend this offer of free data to approximately 390,000 students. Also, what UNISA did, they sent out a survey to all its students a few weeks back, asking them which data service provider they use, which cell phone number they use, which device they'll be using for the exam. So they gained all that data. And through that data usage, they've actually drawn up these contracts with all the network service providers and they've uh, utilized all these different tools and techniques. So I ask you, what measures are your institution putting in place to swiftly switch to e-learning? This is an important article that actually shows how UNISA has moved towards online uh, examinations and how they're providing free data to all students. So now the question remains, do we still experience any challenges? The simple answer is yes. We are all learning as we go along. We are struggling, we are all finding our feet, we are all learning new tools and techniques. We are learning new things every day. We're trying to support each other as colleagues. We're trying to answer students as best as we can. We're trying to allay their fears as best as we can. And that's why we see the need for this transnational collaboratory where we share our experiences and practices to help each other move more swiftly and more efficiently to the e-learning platform. Uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them now. Keep well and take care. So Ashna um, is doesn't appear to be available at the minute. So I'm, I'm just going to invite my um, colleague, uh, Mustafa uh, Abi to perhaps share some reflections and insights. And I think particularly in light of maybe that latter uh, presentation, but also thinking about the, the other presentations. Um, so from the Global South, uh, from uh, Aisha's presentation in South Africa, but also considering um, David's presentation about the United States and the, the variability that exists even within states and towns and how that's reflected across the center, uh, across the sector in relation to higher education. And also uh, in regards to Geraldine's um, insights around moving assessments online. So over to you, Mustafa, to give us maybe some insights, some um, key pointers, some thoughts and reflections, and perhaps also pointing us 
towards the um, towards the future in terms of include. But but perhaps before we get there, what I would like to do is to thank Ashna in particular for her um, hosting of the event today. So over to you, Mustafa. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you indeed. Uh, clearly, insightful presentations uh, as the world is going through a critical period of time in the light of uh, the global pandemic. Uh, well, I would like first to, to thank you, Sean and Richard, for introducing the seminar by providing a summary of the background, the conceptual framework of INCLUDE. In my opinion, what, what is unique about INCLUDE is it's inclusive, a global and multicultural uh, vision to develop collaborative and leadership practices in education. Mustafa, sorry, can I ask you to share your screen there as well, if you wouldn't mind? Thanks. Uh, I don't have uh, a slide. Uh, no, 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 that's okay. Just to kind of share your, 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 your actual, uh, your, your screen, so your videos, so that we can... You can see me, Sean, because... Okay, my... great. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, can you see me now, yeah? Yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, the, as I said, uh, what's unique about INCLUDE is its uh, inclusive uh, uh, agenda and its multicultural and global perspective to develop collaborative and uh, leadership practices in education, and that's, uh, that's very appealing to me personally. Um, Thank you as well to David, Geraldine and Ashia for offering a very crucial and, in my opinion, again, a positive look into education, uh, intense tra trajectory towards online learning. This education change, as David has shown in the context of the US, has its repercussions on different stakeholders, schools and the larger community and even our overall education philosophy, but most important of which it exposes inequities and therefore the need for a more inclusive design of online education and learning. Uh, a key component and equally challenging one of online education is assessment, which Geraldine has uh, timely raised, offering a very valuable discussion of the challenges, as well as the different innovative models of assessment of online learning, as learning, as and for learning. As she rightly points out, more authentic and engaging approaches to assessment are key to successful online learning experiences. So thank you, Geraldine and uh, David. While concerns for online education are shared worldwide, the implications and challenges beyond, go beyond communities. Uh, it's, it's actually a divide between uh, the global south and the global north, as Ashia uh, rightly referred to, to. Ashia has offered a very accurate description of access and accessibility. Uh, challenges in South Africa and I would say coming from Morocco uh, in uh, by and large in Africa and developing countries which indeed calls for a proactive universally designed education in this part of the world. So thank you Ashia. Uh, on a related note while there has been hype uh, and rightly so about transition to e-learning in response to the pandemic, not much attention has been given to the impact on students' affect and the overall students' experience. Uh, cognizant of its importance, INCLUDE is organizing a student seminar by students, for students, on their well-being and emotional wellness in the current context of the lockdown and online learning. So, I, I would like to uh, invite you to encourage your students to participate and be involved in. Of course, we'll be sending you emails with further details. 
last but not least, I would like to thank our participants from all over the world. And we look forward, of course, to welcoming them in another successful Include experience. Thank you very much. And over to you, Sean. Great, thanks. And perhaps Richard, you might want to pop in here as well. Thank you so much. You've done a wonderful job at summarizing there, uh, Mustafa, around the insights um, and shared uh, information by the present uh, presenters this afternoon. Um, I mean, as we're just pretty much right on time, five minutes perhaps over time in relation to the event. So it's it just at this stage, it gives me a uh, Good pleasure to again to thank all of the presenters to thank you attendees for your patience and persistence um, and understanding in relation to uh, the challenges I suppose and some of the successes as well the successes are are this wonderful capacity for people from all over the world to gain such insights around the potential for universal design for learning in particular and for include that's incorporating that um, cultural dimension and cultural sustainability dimension and global dimension around inclusive practices. Um, I'll just Richard, perhaps because um, we began with your good self in Boston College, uh, perhaps what we'll do is head stateside um, for the final goodbyes. But once again, I would like to thank everybody for coming along and for staying with us this afternoon. Obrigado, merci, ciao, uh, and au revoir uh, to everybody um, and until we, as an include group, get to meet again on the seminar space. But over to you, Richard, for the final word from Boston. Thank you. Just want to share uh, my, uh, my final thoughts on, on today's event. It's, it, uh, everyone will go a bit better. Today is much better. I'm, I'm grateful to the hard work that the presenters and uh, the, uh, the technical support people here at Boston College provided. Uh, we're, we're all learning how to do uh, Zoom sessions uh, on a global scale, just like we're all learning how to do UDL on a global scale. But I'm, uh, I'm really thrilled with how the organization is developing. I just want to uh, remind everybody that this is a vibrant, growthful, uh, experience for all of us would want to encourage uh, continued engagement and uh, please fill out that survey that you'll be you'll be uh, receiving and let us know your thoughts on how to leave uh, how, how to move forward and also let us know uh, how uh, you'd like to be involved in ways that you could contribute so uh, I bid you adieu from Boston uh, my lonely office here, there's not much uh, activity on campus at this point, but uh, have a great rest of the day. Okay, can I just say just a really final, final, final word? Um, well, there's a couple of final words. It's ma'a salama, which is thank you in Arabic, because we have quite a few colleagues from Morocco. I think there are 60, 70 colleagues from Morocco who have joined us this afternoon. And also... To, um, to thank Betsy Dalton in particular in relation to the website development and Aisha Abdul Sattar. Um, and as I mentioned, Betsy will be in touch, uh, particularly in relation to how best you can support Include in the ongoing collaboratory, and that is the collaboration between ourselves in regards to uh, how we can continue to develop that resource in a, in a really, uh, in a way that continues to go from strength to strength. So I'll leave you with that word of strength. And once again, thanks particularly to Betsy and to Aisha. Okay, goodbye everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>